and good evening, everyone. We turn our attention now to the heavens above. I'm talking about the Open Science Observatories, and I'm pleased to say that this initiative is resting on the shoulders of giants, in a sense, if you like, because we are fortunate enough to have the pioneering Bradford Robotic Telescope now under our wings here, which we bought and we have the experience of our own Pathfinder Pirate Telescope, which was situated in Mallorca for quite a number of years. And we have now combined these two to transform the opportunity for our students and our researchers as far as research and teaching of observational astronomy is concerned. The Open Science Observatories are chiefly concerned with the objects in the sky. The night sky the sky above is the laboratory for the astrophysicist. And the radiation we receive from distant sources is what we need to investigate and analyze to understand what they are made up of. So to unravel the, hist the mysteries of the universe, we need to collect photons and radiation from out there. The Open Science Observatories do this in two different wave bands. We have, in fact, you may have seen this when you came on campus, if you're here in person tonight, near to the entrance, the main entrance of campus, a radio dish, so we can observe in the radio band. This is available for our students for remote control to investigate the structure of the Milky Way. Tonight, though, I would like to focus on the more traditional astronomy, the optical wave band, and our telescopes and observatories we use uh, for students and researchers. They are called Pirate and Coast. And they are, as I indicated, at a very special site in Tenerife. This is one of the best observing sites in the Northern Hemisphere. We are fortunate enough to be able to place our facilities. The two here, uh, the larger one is a 4.5 meter down, the smaller one a 3.5 meter down, at the uh, area of the observatory. Observatorio del Teide in Tenerife, 2,400 meters above sea level, normally above the clouds, and it affords perfect viewing conditions for 80% of the time throughout the year. Of course, we have to wait for night to uh, come upon us, and so I would ask for the lights to be dimmed. What we are observing here is a time-lapse of essentially a night's work of these facilities interrupted by some local uh, technicians and OU staff because this was in the commissioning phase. These uh, facilities are just up and running now for a few months and student use, research use, would be completely via the distant. We would control and operate via the internet and no one would mill about as would be seen in this time lapse. There's two different uh, access modes to these observatories, which I wrote there in real time, which is the preferred option to teach the ins and outs of observational astronomy and of science in the laboratory, as far as an astronomer is concerned, by being able to send the telescope to do certain imaging tasks and then immediately investigate the quality of the image and react to it and learn from it. Or, once you're an experienced observer, you feed into a queue for a nightly program which is made up in advance and the telescope just does it on its own. We offer both opportunities. The astronomy we do is called time domain astronomy because what these telescopes are after is trying to see if any of these sources in the night sky change with time and this is then driven by physics in these sources, and this is where we can learn about the science of the universe. We move on and probably want the light back up. The observatory by day looks like this. You can see the volcano in the background. You can see all the movement there of opening the, the dome and moving the telescope is something that students could uh, also initiate on their own. And, uh, in the corner, we see the interface, which I'm hoping to be able to, sh to show you live. And uh, I go for this to the web browser in the same way as we had before. This is a view of the observatory just now. And it is a webcam view. So this is in Tenerife. 
with the dome open and the telescope staring towards the essentially zenith because it takes what we call calibration frames. You can see here the open dome taking these calibration frames. Clouds are sort of everywhere a bit, but uh, it is clear enough to do. I can turn on the sound. You hear the wind in Tenerife up the mountain. It really is very windy. Okay. It is this interactive device and dashboard which allows the feeling of being on site for student use. I return now to my presentation and would like to tell you a little bit about how do we use this? What kind of work do we ask our students to do and what kind of work do researchers do? There is currently the flagship satellite by ESA, the European Space Agency in orbit, uh, called Gaia. It is a mission which is tasked with mapping the stars in the Milky Way with a precision which is unprecedented. This is essentially scanning the sky, as indicated in this graphic, and creating a map. This is a map, a very recent publication of a map of this uh, satellite. By scanning the sky, it returns to the same position on the sky again and again and again, and therefore is able to pick up if anything has changed. If anything has changed, if a star, an object, changed its flux, it issues an alert down to Earth, and telescopes pick the alert up, including ours. We pick it up and swing our telescope into action and follow the source which changed over time to help the satellite in a task which it can't achieve on its own. This is an example, a very recent example, over the commissioning period of the observatories, it spans about two or three months and shows the light curve, as we call it, so the brightness of this otherwise rather boring star suddenly chomped by a factor of 10, went down and then chomped again, as you can see in this double peaked feature. This is pirate data obtained by, in this case, PhD students uh, on campus. If you combine this data with data by other telescopes around the globe, uh, the network following up Gaia sources, it looks even more complicated, this double spike. You may ask, what is going on? This is not a star. What does it do? What we see and observe is general relativity. Light is being bent by gravity, and this is just explaining what happens. We see from Earth a star, which is rather boring to begin with, doesn't change. Then a second star crosses the line of sight. We don't see the second star, but we see the second star change the way the light is traveling and therefore bent and this magnifies the background star and makes it brighter and then when our traveling star is gone it goes back to what it was before. The complicated structure we see here means it's not just a star it is a double star, a binary star producing this and by looking at the signal we can learn something about the makeup of this traveling star. This is exactly what we will enable our students to do in the now started MSc in Space Science and Technology. The very first module of this is in Space Science. It's based around case studies. It involves very famous missions, Apollo 11, Gaia, as I mentioned, Rosetta and Mars, the Mars Curiosity rover. In the Gaia case study, the students would do exactly as I just uh, indicated here. They receive an alert by this mission, by Gaia. They follow it up with the robotic telescopes. They analyze the data, and they send feedback to the network. So they contribute to a research effort. This is just one example of how the Open Science Observatories will be used. They are encapsulating authentic research in its truest sense. We send our users, including undergraduate students, uh, we equip them with professional grade astronomical instrumentation and send them on tasks which will contribute to astrophysical research embedded in wider projects. It is very motivational learning because the students, when they do this, they start in real time mode. They are linked via audio channels while they do so. So in small groups, they discuss and debate the optimum strategy for observing and getting this job done while they control the telescope, as I indicated. 
We use it also as a very effective tool in public engagement, such as now or afterwards, and I would like to invite you to the stand where you hopefully can press a button to see how you can make the telescope do what you want it to do. And with this, I would just want to stop to say our next step on this journey is to open this service up again to the public by offering a subscription service via the telescope.org website. This will widely increase the reach of the telescope and widen the audience. Thank <music> you.